so if you could uh, find that, you'll, you'll see Joshua and then Judges. And um, I'm a bit of a, a bit of an Old Testament um, person. I like uh, I like Old Testament stories. Um, I don't know if you've uh, read much in the Old Testament. A lot of times, uh, when you dive through the Old Testament, you you see some pretty amazing things that God has done uh, throughout the years of Israel's uh, history. And uh, in the Old Testament, you know, we look forward to Jesus. And then when, as we read the New Testament, of course, we have the life of Jesus. And then uh, beyond His crucifixion and <coughs> resurrection, we now, as the church age, we, in fact, look back to Jesus. And so, um, as I was uh, studying this uh, past week, I was uh, studying a story that, and I know I've, I've preached this message uh, uh, before, uh, probably quite a few times, but I was thinking about the time of Joshua, and as Joshua, and I'll give you a little bit of that background here in just a minute, as Joshua's life comes to an end, Israel begins going into a period of what is known as the Judges. And so the period of the Judges is where uh, you'll see a bit of a cycle. Again, we'll, we'll unpack that in just a few moments. But you'll see Israel go through a cycle of life that maybe you may find yourself in. If you have a the book of Judges, uh, Judges chapter 6, would you stand please? We're going to pick this up this morning in verse 11. Verse 11 of Judges chapter 6. The Bible says, Now the angel of the Lord came, and he sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Oprah, or some people say Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite. While his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if there is with us, if, if, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us, and where are all of his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us, and he has delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Let's pray. Father, we, had, we count it a great privilege to be able to come to church on Sunday. Uh, God, we know that Jesus died for the church. The Bible says He gave Himself up for the church. And God, as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, again, we count it a privilege to be able to come to church on Sunday and to worship one uh, with another, alongside of one another. God, we pray that uh, that You'll be with us in this next little little bit. That we may be able to uh, we may be able to dive into Scripture. That we can open it up and we can understand it as we as we go through it. God, again, I pray blessings on those who came out today. I pray, God, that you'll give them a great rest on this Sunday. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. What a privilege it is to be able to come and to preach for another man. Uh, I am sure that uh, for some of you who may have been here for many, many years, uh, that there have been some great men, uh, even before Pastor John came and preached right here in this pulpit. And so I don't want to take that lightly. I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for the church. Um, I don't know when your church started, but I know that uh, it's been here for quite a few years. Uh, and I've seen some monuments around. I remember uh, many years ago, I preached in Anson County for a couple of years. And um, I remember one time I had to go down to the courthouse to, uh, to get some documents for whatever reason. I don't even know what it was uh, now. And so when I went down to the courthouse to get the uh, land documents, I remember... Uh, seeing that uh, many of your uh, plot uh, deeds, if you will, uh, they contained uh, such things as, now you go down to this branch, or do you go to that tree, or you go to that rock, and that's your property mark. <laughs> Am I hearing an amen from somebody? <laughs> right? And so uh, when I pulled up this morning, there was a stone out in the uh, outside the parking lot, and I don't know what the stone means. I didn't read it. I was, I was busy trying to get in here, but... So you guys know what I'm talking about, and 
And uh, of course, I just wanted to tell you that just to let you know that I know uh, a little bit about your county, and there's a rich history in this county, and so uh, we want to make uh, we make sure that uh, we honor that from time to time. And again, thank you to your pastor. Uh, thank you all for letting him go and, and have some time off. Pastors need some time off. Uh, they they work very hard each and every week, and so they need some time to be able to go and uh, to be away and to be with their families. Also, I was told this morning that uh, your youth are about to go to Caswell. Is that right? You'll be there a whole week? All right. Caswell is a fun, fun place. Um, we, um, uh, we went there uh, many years, well, quite a few years ago now, I guess you could say. And I've had been there a couple of times. Uh, but last week, uh, we heard a report at the Board of Directors that uh, there's been over 100 salvations at Caswell so far this summer. And so, uh, praise God for that. The young people are being... Uh, trained up and uh, they're, they're learning and they're, uh, they're hearing the Word of God. They used to have some good speakers down there. I uh, will tell you a bit of a funny story. I think, uh, I think I've got plenty of time to do this. But um, so years ago, we went on a, a, in fact, it was a short trip. They offer short trips in the spring. And uh, my rule, now you don't have to adopt this rule, but uh, my rule has always been, because I would always go on the youth trips, number one, I was one of the only guys in the church that had the CDL bus license, so I would, I would be the driver. But the other thing is, I always had kids and youth, and I wanted to go see what, the, what was going on. And I like, I like youth events. Uh, how, how many well, of the youth in here that are willing to raise their hand? Do y'all like youth events? Because it's, it's, uh, it's loud music and lots of fun, right? <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, I could probably turn the music down a little bit, but we had a lot of fun. But so my rule always was when I would go on youth events was, okay, I'm the, uh, I'm the, I'm the bus driver, and I'm one of the chaperones, all right? And, of course, down at Caswell, I don't know where you guys stand, but they always separate boys from girls, which is a very good thing, uh, a very necessary thing. But I would always tell them during free time, okay, you can behave yourself, all right? And if you don't behave yourself, you're either going to get yourself in trouble, you're going to get me in trouble, you're going to get the church in trouble, all of which is going to be really bad. And let me tell you, you're going to become my best friend for as long as I need a best friend, all right? And so I think on this particular trip that this one young man didn't believe me. And so uh, they had free time. Uh, you guys might have some free time, and hopefully this will help your counselors out just a little bit. So they had some free time, and I told those boys, I said, now boys, listen to me. There was about four or five of them. I said, boys, I said, listen to me. You guys got some free time, and, uh, and I'm good with that because I need some free time too. So y'all go have some fun. But you got to be back here by, I think it was like 9, 30, 10 o'clock, something like that. I said, so that's curfew time. And it doesn't mean 5 after 10, it means 10 o'clock, all right? So you be in here at 10 o'clock. If you're not in here at 10 o'clock, there's going to be a consequence. Does everybody understand that? Yes, sir, preacher George, we understand that. Okay, no problem. Bye, see you later. Me and one of the other counselors, we go grab a coat. We're having a good evening. We've already ate. You know, everything's good. They're all, you know, having a fun time. I don't know what to do, but they're all having fun. <laughs> so, uh, sure enough, about uh, about 10 minutes till 10, all of a sudden, uh, all but one of the boys, they come up to the door of where we were staying at. And they were huffing him up. Preacher George. Preacher George, we can't find so and so. And I said, What do you mean you can't find him? Well, he was with us about an hour ago, but but I think he found a girl. Like that. <laughs> That's the first sign that you're in trouble, okay? I think he found a girl. Okay. okay. Where do you think he went? Well, he went that way. Okay. All right, we went that way. Well, y'all know he's got ten minutes. I know he's got ten minutes. Well, we waited a few minutes. No sign of this young man. No sign of this young man. I gave him until five after. We go out looking for him. Here's the posse, right? It's uh, 55 minutes until it lights out in the whole place. So we go out looking for him, and we don't get, we, we probably got 100 yards out to the left of the building, and all of a sudden this young man comes walking out behind the building, like that, you know, and I'm looking at him, you know. And then I see this girl, and she's walking the other way, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay, all right. So I said, come here, I called his name, I said, come here. Preacher George, I'm sorry. I said, you know what, I'm sorry too. I said, but tomorrow, you are going to be my best friend. <laughs> the next day, we sat there at breakfast, and he sat beside me. He went through the line with me. He sat beside me. Uh, I went to all his morning classes that morning. And that day at lunchtime, he was still with me. He went back through the line at the cafeteria. He got all his food, same with me. We sat right down at the adult table, and all of his friends were having a lot of fun over there. He looked at me after he got through eating. He said, Preacher George, he said, can I please go see my friends? 
And I said, can you abide by the rules? He said, I certainly can. I said, then you can go see your friend. But I said, I'm going to tell you something. This is just like the state system. I said, um, I'm going to tell you something right now. I said, if you get caught violating the rules again, it'll be double. Do you understand what I'm saying? He said, I got it, boss. <laughs> he never, I took him on two or three trips after that. He never violated the rules again. Because he knew he didn't want to be my best friend. We've had a lot of fun at Catabo. I hope you guys have a lot of fun at it's, good. it's it's really a, a big time, good good place to go. All right, let's get back to uh, let's get back to scripture. So the story of Gideon. You guys may understand the story of Gideon from uh, several uh, different angles. I don't I don't really know that, uh, but um, a lot of people understand the story of Gideon by way of Gideon's fleece. We're not going to talk about that today. I'm not, I'm not going to preach on that message today about the fleece of Gideon. Uh, maybe next week. I'm not sure. I'm kind of praying through that right now. Uh, but today, I really want to speak to the church about the fact that Gideon was called to do something great for God. Gideon was called to do something great for God. Have you ever been called by God or asked by God to do something that you yourself knew that you could not do on, under your own power? I know when I think about... Um, years ago and things that uh, that uh, would come my way and I just simply couldn't do it. And I would say, God, I, I can't do these things. In fact, I remember my call to ministry. I went on a mission trip to Wise Western Virginia. Uh, God called me to preach uh, while we were there doing a small weekend long mission trip. And, and I remember telling God, God, I don't know that I can really do this. And I remember staying up and, and wrestling with God throughout the night. I remember uh, thinking, uh, God, this is crazy. I just... I don't know exactly uh, what's what's going on. I don't know what you're telling me. And, and God, I don't think I can do this. And the whole time God is saying, yeah, I, I, can, I can do it through you. I can do it through you. Here in the story of, of Gideon, we're going to be introduced to him in just a moment. Uh, Gideon is simply asked to do something that he himself doesn't think that he can do. In the beginning of Judges, as you open up the book of Judges, you'll quickly see that the time of Joshua has come to an end. Uh, it records uh, the activities of 12 men, and in fact one woman, as judges and raised up by God to deliver Israel in times of declension and disunion after the death of Joshua. No one was capable of such leadership as Joshua had exercised, Yet God knew that Israel needed a leader at least from time to time. Now ultimately, God's the leader. Ultimately, God's the one who leads His children out. But He does it many times by laying on a responsibility to one person. And that's what He does time and time again. It says the fourfold cycle so common in Israel's history, which was rebellion, retribution, Repentance and restoration occurs time after time after time in the book of Judges. In other words, when things were going well, when they were obedient to God, God would bless the nation of Israel and their times would get better. Uh, they would have plenty of food. Uh, their, their, their lambs would, would raise uh, great big flocks. Things were going well. But sooner or later, they would begin going down the road of idolatry. And as they would go down the road of idolatry, the blessing would diminish and God would have to send a judge to deliver them. So the book of Judges kind of goes like that. They're up, they're down. There's victory, there's defeat. Joshua, when he was the leader, uh, would, would restore them not only to a steady state... Joshua was the one, if you remember, that led them into the promised land after the death of Moses. And so they were not used to this in the beginning. And so this is going to be a big change for the nation of Israel. Now there were different tribes, uh, as you well know. I'm not going to go through that today, but there were different tribes. But I want to, I want to read this uh, to you, which is basically as Joshua is, is ending. In Judges chapter 2, it says, The angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bacham. And he said, I led you up from Egypt, and I brought you to the land which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I'll never break my covenant with you. 
You shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land, and you shall tear down their altars. He says, But you have not obeyed my voice. And why have you done this? Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before from before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. And so it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and they wept. They wept simply because they knew that the angel of the Lord had brought them a message from God. The angel of the Lord had brought them a message from God that simply said, Joshua is dying, or possibly has died at this point. Joshua is gone. I told you before, do not accept the pagan uh, uh, people and their their ways in this land. You were supposed to drive them out. You did not drive them out. Therefore, I'm going to allow them to be a thorn in your side. Now you may be saying, well, what does that have to do with Gideon? Well, because God's going to ask Gideon to do something that has not been done in his lifetime probably before. It says in uh, Judges chapter 6 that uh, Israel uh, was miserable. It says in verse 5 they would come up with their livestock and their tents, speaking about the Midianites, those who were living there, that were supposed to have been driven out, that were supposed to have left the land already, but Israel would not do as God had uh, directed them. The, the Midianites would come up and they would destroy the, the crops of the Israelites and basically hold them prisoner, if you will. It says in verse 5 that the Midianites would come up with their livestock and their tents and uh, coming as numerous as locusts, both they and their camels. They were without number and they would enter the land to destroy it. They were bullying Israel. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. In other words, they were desperately crying out, God, why have you allowed the Midianites to come in and to destroy our crops, to take our livestock? They were stealing their livestock at night, basically. So, so Israel was having a really tough time surviving. In other words, there was a famine in the land, but it wasn't because of a natural disaster. It was because of another nation that was bullying uh, the nation of Israel. So again, Joshua has died years earlier. Israel was on one of those up, down, up, down. Right now they're on a down cycle. And Israel cries out to God. Now I want to ask you something. Have you, has there ever been a time in your life when you cried out to God? Now you don't have to raise your hand, but has there ever been a time in your life when you cried out to God in desperation and you said, God, why is this happening to me? God, why am I going through such a horrible thing as this? This is really where Israel is right now. They're crying out and they're saying, God, where are you? God, why are you allowing such a thing as this? So now we're introduced to Gideon. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah. And it belonged to Joash, the of Israel. While his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. Now there's a couple of things wrong in, in the passage here that you need to know about. This, this uh, young man named Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press. Why was he doing that? Well, probably several different reasons. One of which is you, you don't, you're not supposed to do wheat in a wine press because most of the time you would have so much wheat that you couldn't do it in a wine press. See, a wine press would have been something very much so smaller in a, uh, in, in a wheat uh, situation. They would have had a, a great big grinding wheel and they would have had oxen that would have been uh, pulling the grinding wheel around that would have ground out uh, the wheat. They were doing it in something very small, which tells me immediately that they didn't have very much. They only had just a little bit. It's kind of like, um, uh, if you guys will... Uh, if you own a big farm, which some of you may, if you own a big farm, you process corn, if you're going to do corn, you're going to process corn by way of a huge machine, right, or set of machinery. That's how it processes it. Combine, never how that works. Okay? I don't really know how it works, but they how that works. It's a mass production system. But what if you don't own a big farm and you just have a small garden in your backyard? If you just have a small garden in your backyard, but you want to process the corn, what do you do? 
You go out there and pick it by hand, you probably put it in a five gallon bucket, and you take it in the house, and you freeze it, shuck, shuck it, freeze it, whatever you're going to do, cut it off the top, and then you process it by hand. You see, in the story here, basically, they didn't have enough wheat to do anything big. In other words, they didn't, I don't know, it may not have fed them for that long at all. They were only doing it in a wine press because it was a smaller operation. That's what they needed. Probably implied in the, in the uh, passage there as well is the fact that uh, they were probably trying to hide from the Midianites. In fact, it says it right there. So the Midianites may not have understood that they were trying to get some food by way of the wine press, and so they could hide it easier there. And so the story comes in. We're introduced to Gideon, and he's trying to find some food. Now this is where the story takes off. It says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him. He says to him, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine just for a moment? Now think about this just for a moment. So you're trying your best to get just a little bit of food. I don't know. You're, you're trying your best just to just to grind out a little bit of wheat because I'm telling you, your family's you're hurting. You're hurting. Uh, nobody's eating well, and you're trying your best just to get a little bit of food. And all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord shows up, and it says, "Mighty man of valor, God is with you." How would that make you feel if you think about that just for a moment? You're sitting there trying your best to survive. You're half starved at certain points. And all of a sudden, an angel shows up and says, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. One of the things I would have said was, Whoa, well, wait a minute. Number one, how do you know me? How do you know my name? How do you know that I have any might in me at all? In fact, I'm so hungry right now, I, I'm weak. I don't have any, and there's no might in me. But the angel, interestingly enough, addresses him as you mighty man of valor and he tells him a very pivotal thing. He says, the Lord is with you. We're going to get back to that in just a moment. Gideon says to him, oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about saying, did the Lord bring, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? He says, but now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. In other words, Gideon goes back at him. Gideon goes back at him and he says, you know what? God is not with us because if God is with us, we would not be starving here. You ever, you ever think about that just for a moment? If God is with us, then how come we're all starving and I'm hiding? Uh, I'm hiding trying to... Uh, thresh out just a little bit of grain in a wine press, Why? how could you possibly say that God is with us? What about all the stories that my fathers told and my grandfathers told? Now that's an interesting subject. You guys, uh, most of you probably grew up around here. Is that right? So do you remember the stories that your grandparents told about when they were growing up? Can you remember that? Can you think back to, to your grandparents telling you a story about, oh yeah, well I remember when we used to go catch fish down on that creek down there. I remember when, when, uh, when we used to farm with a mule. I know my grandfather told me stories like that. My grandfather was up, and some of you may know where this is, a little place called Mineral Springs, North Carolina. Y'all know where Mineral Springs is? So uh, there's a place down there off Rocky River Road now that um, there's a big solar farm out there now. In fact, it's huge. But my grandpa told me that when he was a boy, he used to go out there and plow behind a mule. And he said, sometimes the roots would come out from underneath there. And he said, hit you in the shin so hard that you thought your leg was going to break. You see, Gideon is saying that my grandparents told me stories about God, but those stories don't match up with my reality of what I'm currently experiencing which is starvation. We're being bullied by another nation. He says, where is the God of my grandfather? That's what he's saying. Where's the God of my grandfather? What happened to him? You see, at the end of the day, what, what is happening here is that God's about to ask Gideon to do something great. Let me ask you this. Why would God ask you to do something great? You really thought about that? Why would God ask us to do something great? Does God ask us to do things? I think He does. 
I think he does. Have you ever been out somewhere or maybe gone to a special event to see someone famous? I have. I've been out places and seen famous people. It doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does. So you get there, and when you see the famous person in person, sometimes, not every time, but sometimes you're thinking, that's not quite how I pictured that person. They're shorter than what I... I thought they were taller than that, right? Oh, man. I thought they'd be younger than that. They've got a few bags under their eyes. They look so young, much younger on TV. You ever thought about that? That's called movie magic, isn't it? Yeah. Movie magic. See, sometimes when we see the real person, it's not exactly how we had it kind of in our mind. Now here's a question for you. For you. What do you picture Gideon looking like? Think about that just for a moment. What do you picture Gideon looking like? Do you think that Gideon is an old guy? Do you think Gideon is a young guy? I used to think Gideon was an old guy, but then as I'm diving through this, I'm thinking now he's, he's probably actually a young guy. Is he slim? Does, does he have a beard? You know, beards are in these days, right? And so people, have, you know, these guys have these long beards. Kind of like, uh, well, back in my day, uh, now, forgive me for this, but this is before Christ days, ZZ Top, don't y'all look at me like you know what I'm talking about, you know, right? <coughs> Big long beard. Yeah, guy, that's kind of coming back, you know, now, but... Is that how you picture Gideon? Do you, do you figure that he has hair or is he bald? Uh, I was at a funeral last week for uh, one of our uh, seminary um, presidents and uh, ran into an old friend of mine from school. Uh, I graduated seminary in 07 and uh, he doesn't have not one hair on top of his head. He had a full head of hair when he left in 07. I was like, Lord, have mercy, what happened? You see, a lot of times when you a lot of times when you see people and you maybe remember them or maybe you've never seen them but you have a picture in your mind it's not quite exactly the way that you thought it would be. So why did God pick Gideon? You got, you got to think about that just for a moment. Why would God ask Gideon to do this? Why would God ask us to do really anything? Does God need us? Does God want us? Those are two things we're going to ask about. Question number two is, why would God pick you? Why would God pick Gideon, but why would God pick you? Does God need your help? Well, I was taught that God, plus nobody, is always a majority. Do you agree? God, plus nobody, is always a majority. You see, God does not need any of us. God does not need anything because if God needed anything, He would not be God. You think about that just for a moment. I'm going to repeat it. God does not need anything or anyone. Because He's God, He's absolutely perfect, He's absolutely holy, He's absolutely set apart, He doesn't need us, He doesn't need anything that we have, He is absolutely giving us things that He has, but He has no need of anything. Everybody with me? God does not need our help because God plus nobody is always a majority. Does the Bible not say God is not a man? God is not a man. He does not think like a man. He does not act like a man. In fact, it says He, he cannot lie. All right? God cannot lie. He cannot tell a lie. He cannot do anything that's unholy. In fact, I'll get to this in just a little bit, but that's why God sent Jesus because you and I can't even get close to Him because we're so unholy unless we've been covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? You see, God is not a man like we are. In fact, I was once told this neat little story. Do you know the difference between God and doctors? God doesn't think He's a doctor. Now think about that just for a moment. God doesn't think He's a doctor. In other words, God is not like you and I. He doesn't think like us or act like us because He is not us. If God needed anything at all, He would not be God. God does not need your help. He can simply come in and fix it all right now. Do you remember the story of Moses? Uh, when Mo Everybody always remembers the story of the Ten Commandments. So Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and uh, God speaks to him and says, Take your shoes off because you're on holy ground. Moses takes his shoes off. There's a uh, burning bush. 
And God speaks to him. God gives him the commandments. Moses comes down off the mountain. And when he comes down off the mountain, do you remember what was happening? They were having a party. You remember they were having a big party, right? So all of a sudden, the anger of the Lord was aroused. And he speaks to Moses. He says, Moses, he says, the children of Israel, they're down there partying and they've made a golden calf. He says, and don't worry, Moses. He said, I'll wipe every single one of them out. I'll kill them all, and I'll make a new nation for you. You remember that? But that's not in the movie, by the way. Moses pleads with God, and he says, God, please don't do that. He says, let me go down, and let me plead the ca your case with these people. He says, let me speak to them. I'll do the disciplining, God. He says, now this is a pivotal moment here, okay? He says, because God, if you wipe all of them out, if you wipe every single one of them out, He says, all the nations of the earth will know that you could not get a people to love you. Did you realize that? He says, God, if you kill them all, then that will tell the rest of the known world that you could not get a people to love you. God does not need us, but God desires that we would love Him and that we would want to serve Him. God does not need our help. So, next question is, does God want your help? Well, surprisingly, yes. God does want our help. You ever wondered why? You ever thought about just for a moment, why does God want us? Why did God create us? You know, that's a huge subject. That's another sermon in and of itself. Why did God create us? If God is all-powerful, if He knows everything, if He can do everything, if He can speak and bam, the world exists, if He can create Adam from dirt or dust and breathe into his nostrils and, and Adam is a, is a fully functioning man and He makes Eve from the rib of, of Adam, why, why, would he, why would He create us? Why would He allow us to continue? You see, I have asked myself hundreds of times, God, why do you want me to do this or to do that? God, why do you love me? Honestly, I think it comes from John 3, 16. Do you remember that verse? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but have what? Help me out, church. Everlasting. Eternal life. Everlasting life. That's right. You see, I believe that you can very much so prove it from the Scriptures that for God so loved the world, and that's why He allows you and I to function as we do. That's why God allows us to continue to live in, in this world, and that He doesn't come in today and just absolutely wipe us out. It's because God loves us. Does God need us? No, He doesn't. Does God want us? Yes, He does. God wants our help. Next thing, why do you resist? Why do we resist? I've thought about that just for a moment. Now, let's get back to just, just for a second here. God gives every man, woman, and child the freedom of choice. In other words, we're not robots. Everybody understands that. We're, we, didn't, we were not created just as mindless robots that we uh, go along and, and, and there's no control of our own and, and, and all of a sudden God just turns us left and we go left or He turns us right and we go right. That's not how God operates. God gives us a freedom of choice each and every day to sin or not to sin, to go left, to go right. That's our freedom of choice. Now God may prompt you and say, you know what, you really need to take a left here. You really need to take a left here. If He does, I pray to God that you do take that left, but if you don't, there's going to be a consequence, right? God gives us freedom of choice. Why do we resist? The reason that we resist the things of God is because it's in our human nature, which is called a sin nature, that we inherited from our father Adam, that sometimes we're just not going to do the right thing. I remembered uh, uh, asking uh, the seminary president one time, I said, uh, Dr. Geisler, I said, uh, how is it, now, now I'm thinking logically here. I said, if we have freedom of choice, if we have freedom of choice, that we can either sin or not sin, each and every day of our lives, we're presented with different opportunities, whatever that opportunity may be. If, if every single time, from birth till death, we made the right choice, the perfect choice, every single time, technically we could have lived a sinless life. 
He looked right at me. He said, well, technically, you're absolutely right. He said, but realistically, it'll never happen. And he was right. You know why? Because we've inherited the sin nature of Adam. And being those who have inherited the sin nature of Adam, sometimes we don't make the right choice, we make the wrong choice. Just like the story I opened up with. Do you remember that? The kid who was at Caswell, I told him the rules, I told him the parameters, I told him when to be back. But what did he do? Forgot his watch? No, he had a fully functioning watch on his hand. He knew exactly what time it was. He violated the rules. You and I violate the rules. And that's why we resist. We have a sin nature that we're going to uh, be battling with all the time. Next thing is, the task seems impossible. Look back at the scripture here with Gideon. Gideon contends with him and he says, well, where's the God that uh, brought us up from the land of Egypt? What about the stories that my grandfather told me about that? And in verse 14, the Lord turned to him and he said, go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. He says, have I not sent you? And so he says to him, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? How can I do this? The task seems impossible. How many of you uh, here have seen things in your life that you thought were absolutely impossible to do? How many of you, when you uh, first started having kids and you brought that first child home from the hospital? I remember that. And I wasn't the one who had the child. I was the father, okay? But let me tell you something. I remember uh, bringing home our first son going, Oh my Lord, what do we do? Right? How are we going to take care of this child? I mean, he's, he's in the back screaming uncontrollably. It's his first car ride. He hated it. And so he's back there screaming. Uh, my wife is absolutely a nervous wreck, and I am too. I'm trying not to show it. But we're, th we're both kind of thinking the same thing. This is an impossible task. You see, Gideon is telling God, uh, God, you know, you have said that I am a mighty man of valor, but God, I can't do this. Do you know how many Midianites there are out there? There's, and I mean this. This is historical fact. Literally, there are tens of thousands in the Midianite clan. In other words, there's thousands and thousands of Midianites out there, and God calls one man. The task seems absolutely impossible. Next thing, we can't see what God sees. We cannot see what God sees. After the Lord turns to him and says, Have I not sent you? He says, My Lord, how can I save Israel? He says, My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Do you remember David? Remember when they picked David? Remember when Samuel goes and he finds David in the house of Jesse? He went through all of his brothers, and he says, Hey, do you have another son? And Jesse said, well, yeah, I got one, but he's a, he's a scrawny little thing out there messing with the sheep. You don't want him. You don't want him. And Samuel says, bring him. And when he brought him into the house, he was a young, scrawny thing, but the Spirit of the Lord uh, went on to Samuel and, and went on to, uh, to uh, David. And so he picks out David and he says, that's the one because the Spirit of the Lord was with him. It wasn't what his eyes saw. It was what the Spirit revealed to him that that's the one. Gideon is saying, I am the least in my father's house. Verse 16, But the Lord says to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites just as if it was one man. Did you catch that? Oh, my Lord. You see, we can't see what God sees, but God sees Gideon as a mighty man of valor because guess what? It doesn't matter how big or small, how slim or, 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 or whatever that, that Gideon thinks that he is. What matters is who God is. It doesn't matter every time who we are. It matters who our God is. Amen? Yeah. And so he says to him, I don't care about what you're saying about who you are. He says, I will be with you. You remember what I started <laughs> off with? God plus nobody is always what? A majority. In other words, if you're on God's team, you're on the winning team every single time. Make no mistake about it. God's always going to win. There's, there's absolutely no mistaking that. He says, I will be with you, Gideon. So much so that he says, you're going to defeat the Midianites just as if they were only one man. Why do we resist? 
Because the task seems impossible and we can't see what God sees. I want to end up today with a story that I found and I want to read this to you. Speaking about a calling. This was a calling to ministry. Charles Fuller, he lived from 1887 to 1968. He pioneered the Christian radio work preaching for nearly 30 years each week to 20 million people on the old-fashioned revival hour broadcast live from Long Beach Auditorium in California. Now, I may be wrong, but I think that Billy Graham had some part in that radio ministry too, but I'm not sure about that. And it would have been before Billy's time that, that this guy was, was living, or a little bit before that. But so the old-fashioned revival hour from Long Beach Auditorium in California is where he started his ministry. But let's back up just a little bit. It says in 1919, Fuller was working in the orange groves of Southern California as a manager of a fruit packing house. It says for some time he had been restless, increasingly convinced that God wanted him to, wanted him to resign and go to the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Some of us know that today as Biola University. He was to go there for training for ministry, or at least he thought. He thought God was calling him into a ministry. He began to view his work in the packing house as just a continuous whirly gig, he says, a year-round race. In other words, uh, he says, uh, I feel like a hamster that's on a wheel. He says, I'm running, running, and running, and running, and running, but I'm not getting anywhere. They're in the packing house. He said it was just a matter of getting the best price for the produce year after year. One morning in April, as Charles Fuller sat in his office in the packing house, the conviction that he should go into full-time service became so powerful that he had to leave his desk and find some place where he could be alone to pray. So he went downstairs through the packing house where men and women were working, and he went back to a storage room where the makings of orange boxes were stored, and he knelt down behind a stack of boxes. He struggled with the fear that he didn't have the fluency and speaking ability needed for preaching. He worried about the financial ramifications of leaving his job. In other words, God, what am I going to do? If I leave this job because they're paying me really well, God, if I leave this job right now, then there's no telling I may starve. Does that sound familiar a little bit with Gideon's story? Gideon's trying to, he's trying to get a little bit of wheat. He's doing it in the wine press, so it's a little bit he's trying to survive, but God, I might starve. In the story, it says, especially as he had recently made a down payment on a 20-acre orange grove of his very own. In other words, he'd already started making plans for the future. He was going to go into the orange business by himself. At first, these obstacles seemed too great for him, so he rose to go back to his desk. But God's hand was so heavy upon him that he sank to his knees, and again he said, Oh Lord, I will walk in your path. I will even try to preach. I will resign my position and trust you to supply our needs as I prepare for ministry. Peace immediately came to his soul. And he soon notified the board members of the packing house that by fall of that year he would be resigning so that he could study at Biola University. They took the news sadly. One even going so far as to say, Charlie, you're too good a man for ministry. You should stay here. Why, a minister only has to work one day a week, Sunday when he preaches. Well, we've all heard that. Furthermore, I don't think you're qualified for the ministry. You might starve. But for Charles Fuller, there was no turning back. You see, he had resolved that day to follow God. From that day on, he felt like Paul who said, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why do we resist? Because the task seems impossible. Why do we resist? Because we can't see what God sees. You see, Charles Fuller went on to have a very successful radio ministry. It is said that many, many people came to Christ through his radio ministry. Now, I mentioned just a moment ago Billy Graham. Many, many people came to Christ through his 
preaching through the radio ministry, his crusading, he is uh, just just thousands of people coming to Christ. But these men, these great men of old, at some point resisted something from God and said, God, I don't think that I can do it. God looked right back at him and says, yeah, I know you can't do it on your own, but guess what? With me, you can do anything. Because all things are possible with God. What about when God asks you to do something? You might be sitting here today and you're thinking, you know, I don't know what God's asking me to do. And I don't know what God's asking you to do. But if you think, think with me just for a moment. What is God really asking us to do? As I was studying this week, I really thought about the story of Gideon. God goes in and says, you're a mighty man of valor. Gideon says, no, I'm not. I'm just a, a weakling. I'm a commoner, whatever. God says, you can take the Midianites. I know that there's thousands of them out there, but you can take them just as if it was only one man standing out there. Gideon, you can do this. When God asks you to do something, what are you going to say? Are you going to be like Gideon? Are you going to resist? Because you see, we are called as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are called to be a representation of God in a lost and dying world. Did you know that we're image bearers of God? When the kids go to Caswell, they're going to be image bearers of God. They're going to be image bearers of Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. They're going to be image bearers of the parents that raised them. Did you know that? When we go out these doors today, you might go somewhere and eat. I don't know. You may go somewhere and shop. I don't know. You may go home and sit on your front porch. But did you know that you've been called as an image bearer of God? See, I think that's, I think that's the most important thing here in the story of Gideon, but also in the story of the whole Bible. When God asks us to do something great, the greatest thing that He has asked us to do is to bear His image into a lost and dying world. Because we're called to be image bearers of Almighty God. You might be sitting there today thinking, you know, that's kind of a foreign concept to me. And it may be a foreign concept to you. If it is a foreign concept to you, then I want you to really think about today. Have you been covered in the blood of Jesus? Because if you have not been covered in the blood of Jesus, you don't know what I'm talking about. But if you have been covered in the blood of Jesus and your sin has been forgiven, then you fully understand what's going on here. Maybe you haven't been an image bearer for God. Maybe you've, maybe you've backslidden just a little bit. You want to come forward today and, and pray about that. That's fine. That's no problem. Maybe when your pastor gets back, you can talk to him about that. But if you don't understand what I'm saying today about being an image bearer for God... Maybe you're not really saved. Maybe you really don't know who God is through His Son Jesus. You can change that today. Do you want to be an image bearer? Because I think God's asking somebody. I think God's asking somebody. Are you really the person that I've called you to be, that I've made you to be? Are you bearing my image to the world? You see, when God called Gideon, I didn't go through all the story today, but Gideon actually does go. God reduces his army, you know that, reduces him down to a couple hundred men, and he goes out and thousands are defeated. Because Gideon accepted the call to bear the image of Almighty God. Let's have a time of closing out if we could. As we close out the service today, I want you to think about that just for a moment. Think about what it means to bear the image of God. What, what does that really mean? What does it mean to bear the image of God? What does it mean to walk out that door to go and, and to show the world that I know Jesus. If you don't know what that is, you can change that today. You can pray to receive Jesus Christ today. As we close out in uh, song, is there a hymn there?